Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing solvable groups. Ok, so we're currently trying to show that if a group G is solvable, then any subgroup of that group is also solvable. Ok, right. So the way we've done this is um, we took the subnormal series where all of the quotient groups were abelian for G, and we used this to construct what we've shown now is a subnormal series for our subgroup capital H. And basically all we did is we took all of the subgroups involved in the subnormal series for G and intersected them with H to get uh, a subnormal series for capital H. Okay, what I now want to show you uh, is that actually if you take all of these quotient groups for this subnormal series that we've constructed here, they're always going to be abelian. Okay, so the next thing that I want to show then is that if I take HI plus 1 and quotient it out by HI, uh, these are all going to be uh, abelian. Okay, so initially what I want to do is draw a picture to explain why this is true, and then I'll give you the more rigorous argument. And in order to understand this, you are going to need to know about products of two subgroups and also the second isomorphism theorem. To understand rigorously why this is true, you need to uh, know about products of subgroups and uh, the second isomorphism theorem. You need to be very familiar with that content, and if you're not, I would recommend that you go uh, back in the playlist on group theory and watch my videos on the product of two subgroups uh, and um, the second isomorphism theorem. They're next to each other in the playlist. Okay, right. But firstly, let me draw a picture to explain intuitively why this is true. Okay, so it's going to be the same picture as we had up there with an added detail. Okay, so again, here is GI plus 1, and I've got GI inside of it, so this sub-portion is GI. Now, GI is a normal subgroup of GI plus 1, so we can use GI to quotient up GI plus 1 uh, into a coset partition, and of course the left coset partition and right coset partition will be identical here. Okay, so let's go for how many cosets do I want here? It looks as though it's going to split nicely into 10, so I'll do that. So here are 5 cosets, now we need another 5, 6, 7, 8, and then 9 and 10. Okay, so here uh, is the coset partition of GI uh, plus 1 uh, into the cosets of GI. So let me just colour this in. So again, we'll have uh, GI outlined in orange here and GI plus 1 will have outlined in red as before. Okay, right. So, of course, these cosets are going to become the elements of the quotient group. They will become the mathematical objects that are represented by the symbols in the quotient group here. Again, the composition law is, as usual, take representatives from two cosets, um, compose them together in the initial group, uh, and then take the coset that contains the answer. Okay, right, and we know that, that quotient group that we get uh, is going to be a helium. Okay, now, let me add on, then, um, our subgroup H intersect GI, uh, which will be nicely here, so let's say this is it. Uh, so this can be um, GI plus 1 intersect H, or rather, we've always written it the other way around, I think here, oh, well, never mind, it doesn't matter. Uh, H intersect GI, which, of course, uh, we have been referring to HI plus 1. Okay, so a reminder that we're not showing all of H here, just the portion of H uh, that is inside of GI plus 1 here. Okay, and now there, we have capital HI here, okay, um, which is uh, capital H intersect GI. Okay, right, so what we're now considering doing then is quotienting HI plus 1 out into HI by HI. And uh, what I want to conclude is that this is going to be abelian, and I'm going to get that somehow from the fact that GI plus 1 quotiented out by GI uh, is abelian. Well, this picture captures Y perfectly. Okay, can you see that when we quotient HI plus 1 out by HI, these portions here, these portions of these cosets of GI that are inside of HI plus 1, they are going to be the cosets of HI inside HI plus 1. So when I take the coset partition of HI plus 1, it's just going to do these exact same cosets here, just the portions of the cosets of GI that are inside of HI plus 1. Okay, and therefore, truly, you're just going to get 
a bunch of cosets from this one here. So this is actually going to be isomorphic to a subgroup of this one, and therefore, of course, any subgroup of this will be abelian, and that's why this is going to be abelian. Okay, uh, so the composition law, I should point out, will be identical because um, it, the way it works is you just take two representatives and compose them together according to the initial group composition law and then take the coset that contains the answer. Okay, um, you could have used representatives in these parts of the cosets to work out uh, which coset was going to be your answer. Okay, so indeed this will be a subgroup of this, and the picture captures that. Okay. Uh, the important thing to say here, of course, is that the way I've done it, I should have, if I was doing this more uh, accurately, I would have gone for five cosets there, so that, of course, uh, the number of cosets in here divided the total number. Okay, this, don't take the picture, obviously, too literally in this case. Obviously, this would break the Grange's theorem if this was the case. But it captures the concept that is key here, that the elements of this are just going to be cosets here where you've restricted the number of elements in the cosets. You've taken lots of elements out of the cosets. You might omit some cosets altogether. I mean, these cosets here haven't got any elements in HI plus 1. They're gone, okay? But the point is it's going to just be the same cosets as here, maybe with a few less elements in, but that doesn't actually change the way composition is going to work in here. Okay, now the question is why is that the case? Because you are fully entitled to say, well, why is that going to be the case? Why are the cosets I get here going to be just the same as the cosets here with bits chopped off them effectively? Okay, why couldn't HI plus 1 have looked like this, for instance? Why couldn't I have had a bit like this? I mean, you've done this picture to make it show exactly what you are claiming here, but why did it have to be that way? Why couldn't I have had HI plus 1 in this shape here, and then look, I would have ended up with a great bit of this coset that wasn't part of the uh, coset of HI here, so this bit would have had to be in a separate coset from this one, and you'd have created new cosets. Okay, why? Uh, doesn't this happen? Why does this work so perfectly? Why is it the case that the elements here are just the same cosets as we had here, just with fewer elements in? And of course you get rid of a few cosets that don't have any elements in HI plus 1 at all. Why does it work so perfectly? Well, the answer is very long, so what I'm just going to use is I'm going to assume that you know about the products of two subgroups and the second isomorphism theorem, and I'm going to use that. Rather than go for the full explanation, I'm just going to use uh, the fact that we've already addressed very similar questions in those videos there. Okay, so using the knowledge from those videos then, what we can do uh, is we can uh, take the subgroup product of HI plus 1 with GI here. Okay, so what we can consider constructing is the subgroup product of HI plus 1 with GI. Now, of course, GI is a normal subgroup of GI plus 1, so this will end up being a subgroup of GI plus 1. Okay, so on the picture, what this will end up looking like is you'll put together all of the cosets of GI that have elements of HI together, uh, sorry, elements of HI in. Okay, so on the picture, what this subgroup product would look like is this, outlined in pink. So you'd go through all of the cosets of GI in GI plus 1, which contain elements of HI, and you union them together, okay, to form this subgroup product. And as I say, because GI is a normal subgroup of GI plus 1, this will be uh, a subgroup of GI plus 1. Okay, now whenever this ends up being a subgroup of GI plus 1, you can then apply uh, the second isomorphism theorem. And what does the second isomorphism theorem say? The second isomorphism theorem says that if you quotient this out by GI, which of course will still be a normal subgroup uh, inside of uh, this subgroup of GI plus 1, GI was a normal subgroup inside of GI plus 1, this is a subgroup of GI plus 1, so GI will be normal inside that. If you quotient this subgroup product of these two out by GI, i.e. you take these cosets that are within the subgroup product of them, okay, and you make that into an algebraic structure in the normal way, that what you end up with is isomorphic to what you would get if you took HI plus 1 here, in yellow, and quotient it out by the intersection of GI with HI uh, plus 1. 
Okay, so in this case, it would end up isomorphic to HI plus 1, quotiented out by HI, i.e. if you take HI plus 1 here, and quotiented out by the intersection of HI plus 1 with GI, uh, which is HI here, and you've got these cosets here, i.e. the structure that you would get by partitioning HI plus 1 into the cosets of HI, and forming this algebraic structure is the same as for the uh, entire subgroup product quotiented out by GI. Okay, and from the picture, that's obviously very intuitive, um, but this is rigorously proven in those videos on the second isomorphism theorem. Okay, right. So, what does this, why is this so useful to us now? Well, here's the thing that we want, HI plus 1 quotient out by HI. And I'm now told that this is isomorphic to this subgroup product, which is just a subgroup of GI plus 1 quotient out by GI. Well, of course, this is just a subgroup of GI plus 1 quotient out by GI, because I've just taken the subgroup of GI plus 1 and quotient out by GI. This will correspond to a subgroup. Uh, of the entire quotient group of GI plus 1 quotient out by GI, hence this is isomorphic to a subgroup of this, this is abelian and therefore any subgroup of it is going to be abelian, hence HI plus 1 quotient out by HI is going to be abelian. So basically I've avoided doing a huge amount of hard work here and explaining to exactly why this works so perfectly and why it doesn't look like this, okay? Uh, if you do watch the videos on products of two subgroups and the second isomorphism theorem, we do grapple with these questions uh, from the beginning, okay, and show why this is true, okay? But it's a very long explanation and that's why I don't want to have to go over it all here, but know that it does work in this beautiful way, i.e. when you quotient HI plus 1 into the cosets of HI, it is just these portions of the cosets that GI would quotient the product of uh, HI plus 1 with GI into, uh, restricted down to the bits that are actually in HI plus 1, and therefore it truly is isomorphic in the way the second isomorphism theorem uh, describes. Okay, so that's why I can conclude then that the quotient groups that I get there are all going to be abelian. Okay, so what I have now found for my subgroup is a subnormal series where all of the quotient groups are going to be abelian. Of course, uh, as I've been saying throughout, we can't guarantee that all of the containments are proper. If you have some somewhere it is just equal to, of course, just omit them, just get rid of them. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so you can turn it into the nicer looking uh, subnormal series that you want. Okay, so that then proves that a subgroup of a solvable group is also going to be solvable.